Welcome to the Cross Border Interview Podcast, a podcast about getting out from behind the keyboard and just talking. Each week, we invite a guest or two to sit down and talk about their life and their work. I'm Christopher Brown, your host, and this is the Cross Border Interview Podcast featuring Kathy Valentine. Uh, Kathy, I want to thank you so much for doing this. Uh, greatly appreciate it for sitting down and talking about your new book, All I Ever Wanted, a rock and roll memoir that was released. Yes, that was released in March of 2020. You are doing a cross Canadian tour of the book now. How's it going? How's the book tour going? Well, you know, I, I did this when it came out in America. And uh, it, it went really well. It was definitely disappointing because I had a 23 city book tour lined up across the country. And um, I had some really interesting musicians and writers, you know, partnering with me at a lot of bookstores. And I was really excited because, as you, you may or may not know, I also made a soundtrack of the book. So I was going to do these appearances. And not just read from the book, just kind of talk, meet people, play a few songs. And what I really was writing the book was that I've always done things for a band. Like I, I very rarely stepped out and just been myself. And the book kind of, and it's a lot of it's because I don't really want to be a solo artist. As anyone will read my book, will 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 gab. It's like all I really wanted was to just be in a cool band. Um, but I'm kind of finding it pretty cool to just be Kathy Valentine. And that was going to be a great chance to do that. So I'm, I transferred it to, to uh, virtual and it, it's been going really well. But I have to say, when I met Eric and Eric said, I just don't think your book has gotten uh, the attention in Canada that it deserves. And he, he asked if he could, you know, kind of help out. And I was like, absolutely. So for the past month or so, I've been doing pretty much only Canadian interviews. And I, at the risk of sounding like a traitor, you guys are just so better in every way. I mean, you're just better, 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 better. Like, it's just been, it's been so nice. Like, I never, like, I'm like, ugh, i got to talk to another Canadian. <laughs> Well, well, I'm glad to hear that because uh, you've probably been, gotten used to the same question being asked over and over again. Uh, but I'm going to try and spice it up for you here so you're not at answering the same question. Um, I usually talk, uh, my first usually set of questions is about why you decided to write this book. But you tell in the first like two pages of the book why you wrote this book because your daughter asked you the exact same question. So well, I'm going to... I'm going to let you answer it for my listeners. Why did you write this book now? Well, it's it's a it's a multi answer that I don't think I even had that when I when she asked me. I was like a little struggling with what to say, but um, but in the course of my interviews, I've had a, a chance to think about it a lot, and uh, there there was a few aspects. Number one, I wanted to write. You know, I wanted to expand my career from just being a cool chick and a cool band because there that has limited possibilities and, and and I have spent so much of my effort and time you know when I'm not in the go-go's I'm still a musician I'm still playing in bands you know then you know unlike I will say unlike the other my bandmates you know I constantly am playing in a band I'm never not in a band and it's been that way for almost 45 years. So I wanted to expand on that. And writing seemed like a natural thing to do. I, I'd been taking college classes. I'd been in some creative writing classes. I knew that I was writer, a writer. I knew that I could write. But it, it would then became kind of clear that my story would be the best story to kind of get on the map. Because number one, it was compelling. I felt I had a good story to tell. It was, you know, there was enough... Uh, even without the go-go's, enough uh, compelling human interest stuff in terms of how I was raised, having a dream, finding it, losing it, having to find myself again after achieving something so phenomenal. So there was a compelling story there. And uh, I also think it's important that women in music, you know, get our stories out there because that's kind of that visible. It's just another way of being visible and 
passing the torch, inspiring other people. And, you know, as a literary memoir, it's kind of a way of just getting, communicating with people saying, hey, things can go really awry, things can go really wrong. Uh, you can deal with a lot of pain and sadness and still be successful, still find love, still, you know, get all the goodies and treats of life. And sometimes it doesn't feel that way when you're in the middle of things going haywire. So it's always nice to read someone else's story and see what they've uh, achieved and accomplished and overcome. And usually with memoirs, and, and I'm, I'm taking uh, your book into consideration when I say this, is you read a memoir from an artist, from an entertainer, from anyone, you're going to find out things that you didn't expect. Uh, I can say that when I read your book, I found out a lot of things I did not expect, including your upbringing, because you so often just want to keep somebody on a pedestal of what they are and who they are as an entertainer. So you don't want to look at their past, but you're open about your past. You're open about your childhood living with your mother as a single parent in Texas. Was it hard for you to keep an open perspective when writing the book like that? Well, first of all, I started out just, I knew that my book had to be very, honest and open and vulnerable and that's new for me because in my um in my life I, my my mode of operating in the world is you got to be strong you're not going to serve if something bad happens or makes you sad you just push it out of the way and you just move forward and that's how you survive and so that was always kind of my way of getting through and surviving and as I got older and more into my sobriety and stuff I think I started learning that you know that these things that we kind of try to push away or shove down there's they're there we don't get rid of them and really the, the only way through it is through it and so the book was I was ready for that and the book gave me a chance to process and grieve and mourn and heal uh, wonderfully, like better than therapy, way better, more cheap too. And um, I, I wrote everything. I wrote all, I, there's a lot that got cut out of the book. But what I kept in there was things that I felt were the, the most difficult things to share. And because I didn't want a, a fluff piece. I mean, I'm not, I'm not some big celebrity or like giant star where where every little thing I say, people are going to hang on my words. What's going to make people hang on my words is if they're honest and well-written. And so that was my goal is like, okay, it's got to be honest and it's got to be vulnerable and it has to be extremely well-written. So I'm proud that I was able to meet those objectives. How, how has the fan response been since releasing this book? Because uh, as someone who is so open in the book, were you expecting people to reach out to you and say, thank you for being so open because you've been open, now I can be open? Or how has that fan response been since you've released the book? I've gotten so, I've got an overwhelmingly great response. Uh, there's a few, I, I, get, I think I get a better response from re, just general readers who enjoy memoirs or reading uh, people in music memoirs. I, I think some fans felt like I didn't talk enough about the band and all the things that have happened in the last 30 years, but that wasn't my book that I was writing. I never set out to write the story of the Go-Go's. You know, that, that wasn't what I wanted to do. I wanted to write my story and the Go-Go's were part of that. So, um, but what I really enjoy hearing is people that have, said, you know, that was, it, it, I mean, everybody's curious what it's like to be in a band and to, to pull the curtain back and show the ins and outs. And I think that's interesting, but I think what really resonated with readers uh, was the stuff before and after, you know, and how dealing with <clears throat> abandonment, uh, neglect, uh, deep, dark sadness, uh, achievement and gaining everything you wanted all I ever wanted and then losing it all and how you how you pull yourself back together how you find yourself in the world again as as something other than what you've worked for you know what I mean it's like it's probably like someone that works so hard and works their way up the ladder and becomes like 
you know, the the next in line to be the CEO and then some hot and and all of a sudden they're obsolete and how do they find themselves? So I, I had people from a, a range of backgrounds and, and occupations and careers that resonated even though they weren't musicians in a band because the feelings are the same. Did you find yourself reading, writing this book? Uh, usually when someone wants to sit down and write a book like this and rehash old memories and look back on their life, they're looking for something, they're looking for meaning to move forward. Did, was that in your uh, background or in your back of your head when you were writing this? Or was this more just to tell your story? It was more to tell the story, but it was also to lay a foundation that I'm a writer and that, you know, I, I think if I tried to get a publishing deal and, and enter the writing realm as like, here's my great American novel, or here's my literary uh, collection of short stories. I think that it would have been like, what? No, you're the bass player in the Go-Go's. And I'm tired of that. I, I had gotten tired of that being the sum of who my public, I don't want to say I'm tired of it because I'm proud of it. I, I, so I, that gives the wrong impression. Super proud of my legacy and achievements in the Go-Go's, but I, am and have been so much more, you know, and I felt like that was just a part of my life. And I actually felt like it was not even the most interesting part of my life. So I, I really wanted a foundation like, okay, I can write, she can write. I enjoyed her writing. Therefore, when she does release a novel or fiction or collection of short stories, I would be interested in buying that. I think publishers will be more interested in giving me a look because I succeeded in writing a very good memoir. So there was that, but I did, uh, I did, I did experience, it wasn't so much finding myself. I have decades of sobriety. I'm a mom, you know, I've had, I've come to terms with, you know, that the Go-Go's is probably the most successful thing I'll do musically, even though I'm capable and have done many other things. And I'm fine with that. You know, any artist gets to a place where, you learn to just please yourself because you're not always going to have an audience. If you can be proud of what you've done, you know, I think most of us, most people don't get to be huge stars. You know, I was lucky I got to be in a band that made it one time, but that's hardly my musical career. So I was at terms with that, but um, I felt like, uh, you know, that there was just, I wanted to just step out, I think. And also I did, wasn't expecting how much, healing I would do and how much grieving I still had to do. There was things I wrote about that, you know, there's a chapter, uh, I think it's chapter six, where I write about being raped at the age of 14. And when I wrote that and I wrote the song that went with it, I, I grieved for three days. I, I literally was just crying and I had never, I had never opened that box before before so it was um there were times where i was surprised at what i tapped into but that wasn't my reason for doing it it just sometimes it happened and you you you've written a, a beautiful memoir which opens up a look into your life of and i'm going to use three words here that really encompasses the first few chapters sex drugs and alcohol these are three main things that you went through at a very young age. Um, age 12 is, if I'm not mistaken, if I remember correctly, age 12 is when you started using alcohol and drugs. Mm -hmm. And as you say, raped at 14. Pregnant at 12. Pregnant at 12. Abortion in California, which you talk about so openly in the book. How how do you how are you standing up right now? That's the question I need to ask because you 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 have gone so through so much and yet you are the strongest person I've been able to read a book about and say holy crap how the hell is she standing up so strong with her held head held high with saying you know what I've gone through it but I'm better because of it. Well, you know I I was. Um... You know, I was left to fend for myself. I was left to raise myself. And I don't know too many 12 year olds would do a good job of that. And um, my mom loved me very much. And she supported me in ways that 
more traditional parents don't even do for their their kids. I know people that had very traditional, uh, you know, boilerplate standard issue families and didn't feel loved. So I knew that I was loved, but at the same time, I had a, a, a very deep sadness that my dad didn't want me in his life. You know, my, my parents divorced when I was three and I, he just wasn't in my, he, he went on and married a woman and raised her children like they were his and like I wasn't there. Now I, I since found out after writing this book that, you know, I was actually mattered a lot to my dad, but that's not what I felt like, you know? <laughs> so there was a deep sadness. And I think, uh, being so different in, you know, where I, where I was, you know, there weren't many divorced moms. There were no moms like my mom, you know, and I felt very out of place. I felt like an outsider. And as soon as I found a crack in the seventies, you know, a lot of what, what I write about sounds a little bit, even, it sounds even more, um, salacious and almost now, which is weird, it's almost like we're even more Puritan and more uh, than we used to do. The 70s, right on the heels of the 60s. And if somebody's not familiar with these, it was a very different atmosphere. You know, um, I mean, even even nowadays or even in the like the, the late 80s, people were like all aghast at the sexuality of Prince or Madonna. And it's just... Uh, it kind of just kept getting more and more uptight. So when you look at my story through that lens, it seems really sensational. But back then, the 70s came on the heels of the 60s. The 60s were all about exper experimentation, opening your mind, free love. It was it was a lot different. And the 70s was like that plus 10, you know, like turned up more. <laughs> so uh, it, I mean, I was every person I knew my age was doing the same thing. You know, I, I could have written that book about, I could have written the same thing about a number of people. So there's that, but also it was just tools that helped me deal with the sadness and pain that was inside. As soon as I drank, I felt like I belonged and that became a tool I used for a long time. And, um, was music a know, coping mechanism for you? Yeah, music saved me. I mean, music, like, I think like all teenagers, or young people, music had, you know, given me uh, the idea that there was more than this immediate world. As like I would look at a David Bowie or a Mark Bolan, or and just go, okay, there's people out there succeeding that are even looked up to and revered that are definitely not like these people around me. And it gave me that hope. And and of course, music, you know, always makes us feel helps us not feel helps us cope with with loss and grief and alienation and joy and i mean you know everyone puts on music for different emotional uh re connection you know to wait with their feelings so it did definitely did that for me and when i became a musician it gave me a framework to start putting some of that drive and ambition that also helped me cope with all the loss and sadness because if you're if you are going after something like I did with making it in the music business and putting together a band and being a guitar player and all that it it's a it's a way just like workaholics do it's a way of not feeling you know so I I had many it's music served me much better than alcohol or drugs did but they were all doing the same thing. You know, they were all helping me cope with you, being you, human. You, you talk openly in the book about how during the 60s and 70s, some of the most influential musicians of our lifetime, mine and yours, and probably of the, the, of the, ninth, the 20th century died and it affected you. You talk about George Harrison. You talk about John Lennon. You talk about Elvis Presley. You talk about all these musicians that you you looked up to and you tried to emulate in some sense or even like enjoyed listening to their music and you saw them die a tragic death as a as a uh, going to be a star in the music industry 
Did you look back at the at that and say, okay, I can't let that affect me. I can't let how John Lennon died affect how I'm going to be a musician. I can't affect let how uh, Elvis Presley died affect how uh, my life's going to be. And I'm going to take how their experiences and make them make sure that it doesn't happen to me. Well, I mean, there's a big difference in the in the, those deaths. So I, I I can't say I had the same reaction to each one. Uh, I was most struck stricken by James Honeyman Scott because he was a friend and he was not an excessive user and the way he died seemed very tragic and like it didn't have to happen and that affected me. I mean, I remember all of the Go-Go's talking and saying, if anybody's in trouble or seems like they've done too much, we don't leave them. You don't leave somebody there, you know the way that happened with him, uh, you know, and I was younger when Elvis Presley died and I don't think I related myself to that him at all in any way. And uh, of course, John Lennon was brutally murdered. So I didn't identify with that, but, but in, in general, you know, I didn't, I think most people that drink or do drugs, they, they, they don't really look at somebody that has, I don't think they see themselves and, yeah. uh, you know, like you, no. you wouldn't do it if you thought you were going to. No, understandable. Uh, if but you thought two, you were as bad as the worst people. Two musicians that influenced you, though, are Keith Richards and Chuck Berry. You talk about Keith Richards a lot in the book uh, as someone who you looked up to and how when you got touring with the Go-Go's and open for the Rolling Stones, you were all, you wanted to meet Keith Richards and you were more impressed that you were on stage with his guitars than meeting him. Um, I, I got to ask because I, I want to make sure it's in the, on the record. Did, have you ever met him? Yeah, I wrote about meeting him in the book. It, so yeah, I, I wrote about meeting him in the book and then I also got to in the nineties and he wasn't disappointing at all, very down to earth and it was a, a wonderful experience, but uh, you just said something I just want to refute. I never, I didn't say I was more important to be on stage with his guitars than to meet him. So that was a But you were, you were impressed, I should say. I, I, no, I do no. apologize. Yeah, I do apologize. Was, My mind's a little fripped right now. I do apologize. <laughs> it, was a, it was really exciting to be on stage and see all his guitars there and stuff. And um, I actually got to see the Stones a few years ago and I got to go on stage and see all his guitars in their cases and stuff. And I was just as impressed at age 57 or 58 as I was when I was 22. Um, as we are in the last week of last few weeks of 2020 here, uh, you talk about in your book, how being at a bar on Christmas or the week of Christmas in 1980 changed your life. Uh, looking back on it 40 years ago, almost this week, literally this week, as we record this, uh, could you have imagined that a chance encounter in a bathroom was going to change your life? No, and that, that was one of the things that was so uh, important to me to capture th that that sense of of random chance, and it's something that's always intrigued and interested me. Just those little moments where everything can change, whether it's you know you. You, you pick up the phone or you turn this way instead of that way and how everything that follows can, am I frozen? Nope. Oh, okay. Um, it's funny how like everything that can follow from a seemingly innocuous or random choice can be, can change the entire course of your life. That's just something that has always really interested me because I liked writing about that. No, I had, I, I don't know. I mean, maybe maybe they would have found my phone number and asked me, or maybe it was only because uh, Charlotte saw me and and my name had come up as a replacement. But overall, that chance encounter and that uh, yes, you that chance encounter led to an amazing uh, career, and it started with a brief short. January 1981 to July of 1981 of releasing your first album, going on tour with the band. That must have been a roller coaster for yourself because you were now pushed into the sort of spotlight of 
releasing your first album with the, this new band that you're a part of, going on tour, crossing the country, back and forth, playing all these stadiums. Do you remember most of those eight months? Well, yeah. I mean, I I, I wrote about it in, in a way that my reader is right alongside me. I remember it very, very well. And it was wonderful to write about. And it, and it, it was not right to stadiums. I mean, we, we spent nine months playing in clubs across the country. We were in a van for, for months and sharing hotel rooms. And it was, you know, it was a lot of work and we enjoyed every, every minute of it, but it was really hard work. And, um, uh, and I wrote about every single aspect of it, what it felt like to get our first tour bus, what it felt like to not share a room, to have your own room, what it felt like to go into a radio station and, you know, having sold out the club the night before and do the station IDs and meet the program director and then not have your single added. You know, there was a lot of resistance for this band. We worked really hard to overcome. It took us nine months to get our very first single, Our Lips Are Sealed, just to push it into the top 30. Uh, there was so much resistance. And I wrote about all of that. And, and I think that's one thing that um, I was very successful at doing is I didn't want it to be like, and then this happened, and then that happened, and then this happened. I wrote about it in a way where if you're reading it, you feel like you're there and you understand exactly what it felt like. And um, I didn't write something unless I remembered it very clearly. And I luckily had all my file of facts, day planners. I had lots of journal entries. I kept every piece of press that was ever done on us. And that was surprisingly helpful. So it's very well documented and it's very accurate. I did the, a lot of research. The one area that I want to talk about, and you talk about it in the book, is when you first heard the full album after you, uh, it was produced of Beauty and the Beat, uh, you said in the book that it was not what you expected. Can you elaborate on that for my listeners? Yeah, and that's um, that's something that we the Go-Go's talk about, you know, and other uh like in our documentary and stuff. And we we just expected it to sound a little bit more raw and rock and roll, which is how we sounded live. And it sounded it sounded more sterile, a little bit more kind of just clean. And uh, we, we, we thought it would sound more like, you know, the Buzzcocks or something. You thought it would sound, and I, we were, we were shocked and we were disappointed, but what I said in the book was like, oh, wow. We still get to go on tour. And as the record started getting um, people buying it and selling and selling, you know, more and more, we started realizing that it was actually done just right. Like what we thought, it's a lesson. It's a great lesson for anybody to learn that your, perspective, your perspective and your opinion isn't always the right one. Uh, during that time as well, after the go goes uh, blow up with your music video of our lips are sealed, which I had to watch a few times for the funny part that you talk about where uh, one of your bandmates doesn't want to leave the car. So she ducks down during the filming. So I watched that over and over again. <laughs> um, you, you talk about one thing that became a controversial issue in the band, which was money. Mm -hmm. And with any, with any band it is always going to be a, a, a topic of discussion, but you talk about the writing credits and who gets money and how much money get uh, people get. Um, looking back on that and now seeing how big you are, uh, how big the Go-Go's have become and how uh, big they uh, started with that conversation that you had with that first check of getting your royalties, getting the money for the writing credits. Do you think that you needed to have that conversations to last the length that you guys did? Um, I think that nobody expected to sell millions of records, you know, nobody expected a number one record. So, you know, in our own way, the band and the manager did try to deal with it beforehand. And we had, we had an arrangement where, where the the song publishing, which is, and I go into a lot of detail on this so that 
people can learn about it. I don't want to do it here, but um, the song publishing, everybody would get a small percentage of it. But as it turns out, when you send, sp 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 uh, when you sell millions of records, even with that small percentage of sharing, the discrepancy was really big, and the problem started for the band then. And because everybody's doing the same work, everybody, it's like no matter who writes a song, whether it's me, anybody who writes a song, yes, you need the good song. But if you have your good song without a band that's a, a charismatic, great band with a great lead singer in a van, driving across the country every night, playing somewhere, exhausted, getting up, doing all the promotion. It starts, uh, and then the payoff comes, and there's huge gaps. It's almost like a microcosm of what's happening, you know, in a capitalistic society. It's almost a microcosm of that. You have the little people doing the work day in and day out, and the other people making you know, way more money. So I was a songwriter. I was kind of right in the middle. I could, I wasn't in a, in a, I wasn't complaining about how much I'd made. But on the other hand, it was really important to me that the band stay together and that everybody be happy, especially the lead singer. And I could see very clearly that we were going to have a problem. And I was right. We did have a problem as soon as it became apparent that some people in the band were making three, four, five, six, seven times as much as other people. So, you know, and there's not a right or wrong with that. You know, there, there's no manual, like, this is how you should be in a band, this is how to do it. It's kind of each band has to decide for themselves. But I would always advise a band to just assume, just assume you're going to sell millions of records and deal with it from the beginning, you know, because if you do, you don't want to have what happened to us, you know? True. Um, I, I would recommend anyone who's listening to go out and pick up a copy of uh, All I Ever Want It. It is an amazing read. Uh, one area before we let you go here, Kathy, I want to talk about, and it's a topic that you talk about later on in your book. It's about your sobriety. Um, you, we've talked about it briefly uh, at the beginning of the interview here already, but I want you, I want to let you, I want, I want, I want you to talk about that moment when you realized you need help, you needed help. And you talk about it in the book as well, but I wanted to let you talk about when you realized you needed help and what was it like to get help? Because so many people right now with COVID-19 are struggling and they don't realize what type of help they need. So for you, what was that moment for yourself? Well, and I really enjoy talking about my sobriety. I've, I've done it for many years, uh, sharing the experience. Strength and Hope is a, a great way to carry the message. And my story, I feel, is important because I think there's a lot of people that have the same sort of relationship as I did, which is that I was highly functional. I wasn't a falling down mess of a person. Um, but inside, I felt... I felt bankrupted. I felt hopeless. I felt like nothing was working out in my life. No matter how hard I tried, it seemed like I would sabotage my relationships. It seemed like my career couldn't get on a footing. And yet none of my friends would have said, oh, you have a problem. You need to stop. None of That's how functional I was because in my mind, I had to keep it under control. Because if, if I, I just could not imagine a life without drinking, could not imagine it. So right there, you know, if you can't fathom not having a drink and you feel like your life might be better without doing it, but can't even imagine it, that's kind of a sign. So when I quit, it was almost like I was just desperate for something to change. And it was the only thing I could think of to change. And I thought maybe if I do that, maybe if I change this, then other things will get better. And it was the single most, you know, getting sober. I would say joining the Go-Go's, getting sober, and having a child were the three most profound moments of my entire life. And everything that has followed in the last uh, over 30 years of sobriety has been such a blessing and a gift. And, and that's why I, I like to write about it. I like to talk about it because not everybody ends up 
you know, in jail or crazy or dead. You know, some of people just end up very unhappy and they don't know why. And that's the story that I like to inspire people with. Like you can, you can quit and change your life before it goes to the, all those other terrible places. Um, the last three words of your book, well, the last three words of the chapter book and then before the epilogue is interesting to me because I find I, I, I want to know what you meant by them, because most people uh, don't say this, but you decided to put this in. You said for the last three words of your book is not the end. Yes. What do you mean? What do you mean? I wanted to write a second memoir to me. Uh, so a memoir is a slice of life. It's not an autobiography. When I did an outline of the book I wanted to to publish, I saw that the arc I wanted to tell was a very specific arc. It encompassed the 70s and the 80s, age 11 to age 30. It encompassed a protagonist who, who was myself starting in one place and ending up a very changed, different person. It's a classic storytelling arc, but it wasn't the whole story of my life. I could I could write an entire book about the last 30 years that is almost probably equally as compelling, but dealing with a whole other aspects of life. The journey with the, and I hint at it because I couldn't just ignore some of these things. There was a, a lot more betrayal and ups and downs with the Go Go's since that one breakup that I write about. We broke up one other time. Uh, there was people that were on the verge of getting fired. There was me that did get kicked out. There was divorce. There was motherhood. There was dealing with my mom, which is a very big part of the my story, the relationship between a mother and daughter. So I just knew that at some point in my life, I would write another memoir. Uh, it won't be my next book, but it will be in my future, God willing. Yeah. And uh I also know that you will, uh, the Go-Go's will be going on tour here. Hope, hopefully everything settles down and everyone gets enough vaccines. Uh, are you looking forward to getting back out on the road and touring and actually meeting with fans again and playing in front of yes. large crowds? Yes, I love playing with the Go-Go's. Always have, always, never have taken it for granted, not once. Uh, I've heard other people in the band say they took it for granted and I always want to go, not me. You know, <laughs> I always was, was very grateful. I mean, I'm a working musician at my, now I'm an author too, but I'm always going to identify as a musician. And when I'm not in the go-go's, I always have another band. I'm always recording. I'm always writing. So to get the opportunity to do those things that I would do anyway, I would do them anyway, day in and day out, but to get to do them, for people that give a shit what you're doing and that know your songs and that you're getting paid, you're earning a living. It's a, a, a fabulous, uh, just unbelievable blessing of my life that I ever get to play music on that level. I'm going to ask you one last question, then I'll let you go here, Kathy. Uh, it has to do with your book title. Uh, looking back on your life, have you gotten everything you ever wanted? It's an ironic title because as I look back after writing it, I think all I ever wanted wasn't met always the best thing for me. I mean, it's like, so it's, it's an ironic title because throughout that book and throughout so much of my life, all I wanted was to be in a band. And I sometimes wonder now that I'm just not so focused on just being in a band that I'm like really exploring everything that I'm talented and capable of doing it, doing sometimes I, I think it's it's an irony for me that and it's a lesson too. sometimes what we want for ourselves and that we think is the best thing for ourselves. Sometimes we find out, hey, just, you know, don't be so closed off. Like, no, it's got to be this. I got to have that person. I've got to have that job. This is my dream. It's like in a way. I, looking back, if I had to talk to my younger self, I'd say like, you know, maybe maybe leave a little room for something other than what you think you want. So, and that was an unexpected uh, realization uh, of the book. 
Well, Kathy, I want to thank you so much for doing this. Uh, uh, greatly appreciate it for the listeners. Uh, uh, there will be a link to Kathy's website where you can buy the book and also to uh, the publisher's website where you can buy the book. So I recommend that you go out and get the book because I read it and it was a fascinating read and I recommend it to anyone who just wants a good book. Even if you're not a fan of the entertainment business, it's a good background story of a person who grew up in everyone's lives in the 70s and 80s. So Kathy, thank you so much for this. Thank you. And I'd also like to add that there's an audio book that has been getting a, a fantastic response. And uh, I read the audio book myself and it comes with a soundtrack and a lot of underscoring and people have real. So I, I like to just mention that as well, because a lot more people are into audio books than I know. Yeah. Where can people pick that up? Um, wherever you get audio books, I guess oh. Amazon has that and uh, Google and uh, Apple books. I don't, I don't do a lot of audiobooks, so I'm not real sure, but, um, but I like to read, but so many people, that's what, that's how they like to, to enjoy it, uh, their literature. So I just like no. to remind people that that's available too. We'll put a few links in the show notes as well. Uh, so thank you so much for doing this, Kathy. Sure. It was really nice talking to you. Thank you for your questions. Thank you once again for listening to the Cross Border Interview Podcast. If you love this episode of the Cross Border Interview Podcast, head over to iTunes or wherever you get your podcast and subscribe, rate us, and leave us a review. All the links to our social media accounts are in the show notes or visit www.crossborderinterviews.ca. The Cross Border Interview Podcast was produced and edited by Miranda Brown and Associates Incorporated. Once again, thank you. Whoa!